Pam Ayres, everybody. Thank you very much. Oh, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great thrill to be here. Um, when Robin asked me to speak here, I said, well, I write funny poems, or I try to. Uh, what, what do you want me to say? And he said, oh, you know, talk about farming, animals, the country, give us a few poems. <laughs> <laughs> so as I've only got 20 minutes, I better get cracking, I think. Um, uh, I want to start off by talking about the fact that we have recently downsized, my husband and I. And uh, we downsized from a house we lived in for 28 years. And it was a nice old Georgian house, too big for us, but it was a nice house. And it had 20 acres of land. And I've always been very interested in wildlife and always what my mother said. Uh, she always used to say, oh, I was too soft. You're too soft. I hated it when I found anything injured and there was nowhere to take it. If you found anything hurt, people would just say, oh, I'll knock it on the head, put it out of its misery. Um, that was what people used to say and that used to hurt me I hated it and mum used to say oh you're too soft uh, maybe I am but I've always cared about wildlife and when we went to our house with the 20 acres um, I didn't know a great deal about creating habitats uh, but I learned because I was interested and um, we we planted a thousand trees a thousand native trees and we uh, planted two native hedges as well. And we got in a wonderful team of hedge layers and they laid one of our hedges. And it was very touching how people would stop and say, oh, well done for getting your hedge laid. It looks gorgeous. You know how people were so pleased to see the laying of a hedge. And um, uh, I began to then sort of develop my interest in, uh, in having wildlife around me. And I took up keeping bees. My granny used to keep bees, and my father kept bees, and I finished up with 10 colonies of bees myself. And that was very interesting, although a bit depressing, because uh, there are so many things that can go wrong nowadays, from Varroa, of course, which everybody knows about, to um, uh, colony collapse and hive beetles and all the things that um, uh, seem to have arrived in recent years. One of the things that I loved about our house was that the swifts nested in the roof. And every year they came, and I find them such mad, exuberant birds, and they screamed round our house and chose our house and nested under the same scrape of a tile. I don't know how they made a nest under there, because when the tilers went up once to replace some tiles that had fallen down, there was nowhere that you could see they could um, anchor a nest. But nevertheless, they came back every year, and I just loved them. Um, and one day, a swift was down on the ground, and I took it to the local wildlife hospital, and, um, they, uh, the, and they had a lot of hedgehogs, and they, um, uh, I became very interested in the wildlife hospital. And I started to ha be a rehabilitation place for hedgehogs where they could be released on their 20 acres. But I would leave food and water so they'd have an easier life. And that was lovely. I loved doing that. And we built up a nice colony of, um, of hedgehogs. So that was super as well. And then one day, uh, my family eat meat. And uh, I ordered some free-range chickens, and this um, quantity of chickens turned up from the place I'd ordered it from, and they actually stank. They stank. They were off. And I was so revolted, and I looked around at what we had and thought, as we are a meat-eating family, perhaps I could front up to the, the subject of raising our own meat. And that's what we did. And I, although I always found the betrayal of sending them off for slaughter at the end terrible, I never got used to it, um, it, it seemed to me to be a logical thing to do if you could. And so we had Dexter Cattle, and I had nice people from the Dexter Cattle Society who helped me. And we had Cotswold sheep, and we had Tamworth pigs from lovely Joe Henson, and we fenced off a brambly area. And these Tamworth pigs would be out there prizing it all up with their noses, and they would climb up a sycamore tree. They would put their front legs on a sycamore tree and lift up the bark and crunch up the snails that they found 
hand underneath. And I, I loved it. And I had a lot of bantams. And I put some guinea fowl eggs under the bantams uh, so that this bantam hatched out a, a great... Um, uh, group of guinea fowl and it was very funny because the guinea fowl of course soon start to fly you know and they, so they would all fly off across the field with the, with the bantam running after them <laughs> saying, saying wait for me uh, so so it was absolutely thrilling I loved it and uh, when we left we left because um, our family left home and um uh, and um, it was always a big house and the roof needed to be done and it needed to be rewired really and we thought we'd let somebody else have the pleasure <laughs> of, um, of carrying that out but it broke my heart to leave it was so awful because all the trees and shrubs that grew there had been given to me as gifts I never wanted any jewellery or, or furs thank you very much I always ask people to give me trees and shrubs and roses and creepers and such like and um, so it was very, very hard to walk away. And so this is a poem I wrote. And, and also, I hated the house being on the market. It was deadly. People walking around your house and looking in your wardrobes and cupboards, I just um, loathed it. And I don't know if people mean to or not, but uh, they say hurtful things. Um, one family walking through our house, well, I heard the lady say to her husband, well, um, I hope they take this carpet with them. <laughs> And somebody else, <laughs> and this other woman said to her husband, she said, no, it's not for me. I don't want a project. <laughs> no. uh, and, then, and in my husband's office, in my husband's office at the last house before we left it, he had three posters up because they were sort of important moments in my career. And one was a poster taken down from outside the Sydney Opera House when I played the Sydney Opera House. Uh, so a big picture of that. And then there was a picture taken fr um, from the programme for the Royal Variety performance when I was in that. It, my husband blew up the photograph and put it on the wall next to the one from the Sydney Opera House. And then uh, there was a picture of me receiving the MBE at the Buckingham Palace with my big hat and holding up my medal. So there's three, three pictures when you walked in <laughs> and, uh, and this family walked through and the husband turned to his wife and he said, God, they're keen on Pam Ayres round here. So, <laughs> Anyway, this is, this is the poem I wrote when I left that home, um, which I found very, very hard. See the driveway to our house, now strewn with leaves and softly black. Today I travel down it and I won't be coming back. A hand is on my heart that feels so desolate and cold. A home for half a lifetime, it is over, it is sold. In this house I cried and thought my heart would surely break and felt more joyful happiness than was my share to take. This home wherein for 30 years we flourished and we shone is all to be dispersed, is to be scattered and be gone. We were as they are today, were young and confident and brash and we ran among the rooms in the excitement, in the dash in the thrill of exploration, and our children sang with joy. They have come to take our place, this little girl, this little boy. Shall I tell them? Shall I tell them there are bulbs already peeping? Shall I ask them to tread lightly where my faithful dogs are sleeping? Shall I point to little saplings that two mighty trees have grown? Or slip away in silence, let them make the place their own? Young men from the furniture removal company will sweep away all traces of my family and me. Agreements are in place which I can never now rescind. We are blown away like pollen, like the pollen on the wind. The native birds are singing as they sing here every day. Oh, who will feed my little birds when I am far away? The people, they are restless, I am realizing fast. Already in this house, I am a figure from the past. I will move to some town distant. I could not go by this place. Could not stare down the drive, would have to turn away my face. For I loved it as a friend 
but now must learn to dwell apart from my home, my former home, my home embedded in my heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, anyway, it's not, uh, it's not all gloom and doom because we then moved to a village house and, um, and I was absolutely desolate, to be honest. I was only aware of everything I'd left behind at the other house. As I say, we lived there for 28 years. We brought our children up there. I had a lovely pond with a grass snake that used to swim in it. And I had, and, I, I, and the swifts and the guinea fowl and everything that I loved, and I had to leave it. Well, you might think, why didn't you stay there if you felt that bad? But, um, <laughs> but it was preposterous, as there were only the two of us. So we moved. We moved to another house in a village. And um, that night, the first night we moved into the house uh, was December the 7th. Uh, 2015, and I am a great believer in signs, and um, I went out in the garden, take the dog out that night, and there in the garden on December the 7th was a hedgehog, and um, you know, it just seemed like a sign to me that perhaps even though I only had a garden now, um, I could look into making some good habitats, and so uh, anyway, the first thing I did was I went round to my new neighbours and said, can I put an owl through the wall? Um, <laughs> Uh, because otherwise the only place for this hedgehog to go was out onto the road, the front way. So they were very kind and they said yes and so I made a hole in the wall and there's this tunnel now and a great traffic of hedgehogs go through there. Um, and I know that's true because I'm a p patron of the local wildlife hospital and I have hedgehogs to be rehabilitated and I know that they come and go. Um, and I, it's very unusual, even though I live in a village, uh, not to see a hedgehog every night. So that was absolutely thrilling. And the other thing I've done is I've left piles of brash, because I'm aware that not everybody's got a farm, but I do think you can do loads of things to help wildlife just in your garden. And one of the things um, that I've done, that anybody can do, is to make a heap of pr prunings and cuttings and um, brash, really, and leave it in a warm, sunny place. And I did that, and one evening, no, one afternoon, I was sitting in the garden, and this grass snake came out. And I, they were unusual, aren't they? You don't see them very often. And this grass snake came out of the heap of prunings and made its way along the wall and went into a hole in the wall, which I hadn't even noticed. So I was delighted about that. I thought, well, that's a good thing. And then I planted a nectar border. There was a dark old Victorian shrubbery. Um, we had that all dragged out. It was all old viburnum tinnus and... Um, um, great big garrier elliptica, great big things that weren't much benefit. So I planted that up as a nectar border. And this summer, it's only the first summer I've had it, but it's fabulous. And it's covered in butterflies and bumblebees and a hummingbird hawk moth comes, you know, just from planting things. I looked up on the RHS list of um, plants for pollinators and I chose from those. So it's not a difficult thing to do. Um, uh, anybody could do that. And... Um, the lovely thing is as well that in this new house, although I haven't got the Swifts and I mourned the loss of the Swifts, um, uh, we have got house martins. We've got about 16 house martins nests and they're like little orcas, these little black and white jobs that come every year. So I consider them to be a great compensation and I love to see them. Um, I'm also planting a fruity border. This is my own invention. I'm going to drag out the old beaten up plants and I'm going to put two Loch Ness blackberries on the wall. Uh, these are blackberries that haven't got any thorns and they produce a lot of fruit. And we've got lots of bank voles in the garden as well. So I wor I've worked it out that if the blackberries we don't want fall onto the ground, the bank voles will come and eat them and the tawny owl that's often around can come and take the voles. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, that's what that's and I've also discovered that there is a mulberry a new mulberry uh, which is just a bush and it fruits in the first year it's been developed in Japan I think and I've ordered two of those because I love mulberries and also that will be fruit for wildlife and also for us um, I've got two I've got three hedgehog boxes two have been snubbed and one is occupied by a hedgehog which is hibernating at the moment so that's great and um, on the subject of hedgehogs, um, and because Robin asked me to do a few poems as well in my, in my limited time, um, I'd like to recite this poem, which is one which was published 
in May of this year, and um, it's about hedgehogs. And you have to imagine that I'm a hedgehog, and it's called The Last Hedgehog, and this is a feisty little hedgehog, and he's saying, um, you haven't looked after us, I'm the last one left, and thanks for absolutely nothing. <laughs> uh, this is quite sad, but um, you're allowed to laugh at it. Um, and then I will wind up with something a bit more cheerful, as I don't want you all to feel depressed. Oh, hang on, that's the wrong poem. I just brought all this because <laughs> I, I usually um, don't bring all the things I'm going to say, but I thought this is such an august place, I might feel a bit overwhelmed, so I brought lots of notes. Okay. Farewell, farewell for what it's worth from the final hedgehog left on earth. My cousin Henry, young and bright, went up in flames on bonfire night. <laughs> And um, poor old grandpa, fast asleep, was stabbed to death in a compost heap. <laughs> My grandpa, in one playful bound, fell in a swimming pool and drowned. My gran was old, her eyes had dimmed, but all the same she wound up strimmed. <laughs> you didn't look, you didn't see, and there she goes, an amputee. <laughs> if, in your fence, you'd made a space, we could have moved from place to place, have found a gal, paid our respects, had some cautious hedgehog sex, <laughs> and in a cosy pile of logs produced a nest of little hogs. From now on, when you pull the drapes, you'll see no round familiar shapes. Never more from dusk till dawn will we eat slugs on your lawn. So little gratitude you've shown, from now on, you can eat your own. <laughs> drowned. Drowned in rubbish. Drowned in junk. That's why our population shrunk. You threw down stuff you couldn't use. The plastic rings from packs of booze. Polluted, poisoned, burned and mowed. And run us over on the road. If you'd been a hedgehog's friend, you'd give your pond a shallow end. You'd leave a drink when gardens fried. You'd cover drains where creatures died, where walls are vertical and steep, and starving hedgehogs fall asleep. Like the owl which hunts the mouse, like swifts returning to a house, we fit like interlocking rings neatly in the scheme of things. This is the truth. These are the facts. The whole of nature interacts. And so farewell for what it's worth from the final hedgehog left on earth. In garden netting, tightly wound, I have no hope of being found. Some curtain call, some final bow. You crocodiles, start crying now. Right, now clearly I'm not going to be able to say all the things I wanted to say to you because the time's run out. Um, so I just wanted to say um, that it's very hard not to look back. I know you can't turn back the clock, but it's hard. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Stanford in the Vale, we lived in a row of council houses and you could scramble down the bank to the back fields, we called them. And there was a great big tall blackberry hedge and you could prop a ladder up against the blackberry hedge because it was so thick and strong and you could get an abundance of blackberries and you could walk along and there'd be a marshy area full of king cups and marsh marigolds and frogs and there was a stream and there were always water voles in it, always. And, and my brother saw a kingfisher along there and you could go out into the field and you could pick an abundance of cowslips and we all picked cowslips so there must have been so many and we used to collect things called wiggle waggles and I think the proper name is quaking grass, you know, the grass with bobbles on it that used to grow wild and now 
it's rape this year and wheat the next, and rape and wheat and rape, and it's all gone. And I think it's so very sad, and I, and I believe in the CRT and all the things it stands for, and I just wish you um, all the very best, and uh, I hope you succeed wildly. And I'm going to finish, because I've run out of time now that's flashing at me. Well, not exactly flashing, but, you know, it's flashing. Um, <laughs> With, um, with, this, with this poem, forgive me for I have run over a minute or two, but this is a very brief poem just to cheer you up. Um, I, I, I now live in a village. It's a very nice village. I've got lots of um, creatures in my garden. I'm very happy. I've got four grandchildren. I've got a very nice life. And just over the road is a good pub. Yeah, we've got a good pub, and uh, there's nothing I like more than to go over there on a Sunday with my husband and the papers and the dog and get a table by the fire and have a nice Sunday lunch. But unfortunately, they have started to do something which I don't like. And this is my poem. It's called Don't Put Me Dinner on the Slate. <laughs> When I fancy fish and chips and wander down the pub, please don't put a roof in slate underneath me grub. <laughs> call me out of fashion, call me old and out of date, but when I fancy cod and chips, I want it on a plate. <laughs> Serve it on a breadboard and the smile dies on me lips. I imagine other diners, curry sauce and chips, lurking in the crevices and hiding in the cracks. So please, remove the board and set about it with an axe. <laughs> Plates are very useful. They have stood the test of time. Their surfaces are highly glazed for shrugging off the grime. Who then was the genius, the one who introduced surfaces which cannot be fastidiously sluiced? <laughs> Just a simple plate would do, something you can wash. Not the Royal Worcester or the Villaroy and Bosch. Not the finest china with a willow pattern seam. Something ordinary, something boring, something clean. <laughs> Caterers and chefs, if you would like my grateful thanks, please don't put my fish and chips on slates and tiles and planks. Though not on the menu with lasagna and paella, I'm afraid I might have paid for added salmonella. Thank you very much.